All right, well here we are, Genesis uh, lesson number six, and this one's entitled The Day-Age Theory. The Day-Age Theory. All right, so to keep all this material, you know, to keep all the, uh, all the balls in the air, uh, we do a little bit of uh, review every time we start. So in our discussion of the act of creation, because that's what we're talking about, we've seen that there are a certain order of events that are described as uh, in Genesis, and these order of events uh, follow a certain chronology, and that's what I want to take a look at. First of all, um, the Bible doesn't explain it, it doesn't even state it. It takes it for granted that the very first event or very first thing that we learn in the book of Genesis is that God exists, God is eternal, God has no beginning. Now the Bible doesn't say that. You simply assume it from beginning to read it because it says in the beginning God. So right away, you know, uh, the Bible doesn't defend the idea of the existence of God. Just like in some debate sometimes, you, know, you have one guy who's an atheist, and the other guy is a believer, and they'll debate the existence of God. Well, you won't find that debate in the Bible. The Bible assumes God exists, and that's the very first assumption from the beginning. He is all-powerful, knowledgeable, all-loving. He has the ability not only to fashion and form, but he also has the ability to create, and so the first you know, sentences in Genesis are going to talk about his creative uh, power. Next uh, we have um, uh, God creating the basic elements. He creates the world. Uh, he brings into existence the time, space, and matter elements. Uh, these uh, we have learned are without form, no light, no energy yet, but this is the first act, the first acts on the first day. Then something that we have to find from other sources, God creates angels. Doesn't say it here, but we have to put it into context here because we learn that from other, from other places in the Bible. Uh, if you go to uh, Job chapter 38, for example, it says um, God is speaking to Job here at the end of the book and He says, to Job, where were you when I had the foundation of the earth, when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements, since you know, or stretched the line on it? Or what were its base, uh, on what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? The morning stars, the sons of God, those are angels that God is talking about here in the book of Job. And if, you're, if, you, if you read this passage, it says they were there when God formed the initial elements. So we can, you know, we, we can suppose, we can deduce that the angels were not created after the elements, they were created before the elements, okay? Uh, angels are created. Their purpose, again, not written about in Genesis, but we find in other places. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, the writer says, are they, speaking of angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Such a tantalizing piece of information. Such a tantalizing piece of information uh, that the Bible gives us that that angels, one of their, not the only, but one of their tasks is to minister to, those, to the saints in a variety of ways. Now, we don't know how exactly, you know, that curtain isn't, isn't open all the way that we can see it, but the Bible does say that angels minister. Angels minister to Jesus, right? And we see their appearance, of course, in the Old Testament as they appear to Abraham and other individuals in the Old Testament. So somewhere between the creation of the basic elements, the forming of the finished earth, angels are created. All right, so we move on, review of the day. God finishes the elements into the universe that we now recognize as our world. And last week we talked about the Holy Spirit hovering above the deep, the energizing power of the Holy Spirit brings together, begins to form 
all of those things that were formless and void. And so we see this creative process will be done in a total of six days, and we'll talk about that, the days, uh, in a moment. Now we know that this scenario has been rejected by atheists and agnostics, doubters, who propose that the way that the world came to be as it is was by a system of random selection over a period of billions of years within a context where matter is eternal. And so atheists and others begin with the idea, we've talked about this in other classes, they start with the idea that all matter, it was always there, eternal. And then through a process of selection and so on and so forth, random, all right, random selection, eventually what we get is what we have today. I know I'm putting it in the simplest of terms, but basically that's what they are arguing. Now the creation account has also been altered by those who want to reconcile. I mean, some people reject it altogether. We don't believe in creation. The world came to be you know, through uh, the system of evolution. But there are some people who are believers in God who want to reconcile the idea of evolution with the idea of, with the teaching on creation. And one of these theories that has been devised in order to reconcile the two is the gap theory. And we talked about that last week. And the gap theory works like this. God created the world and because of Satan's rebellion, the world was destroyed. The earth then stayed empty for billions of years. And this is the gap here that they're talking about. And that is when all these fossils and all these dead animals and all this, you know, the, the, the geological you know, evidence that they claim to have, they say, well, that all happened right there during the gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. They claim there's this you know, billion year gap where the process of evolution took place. And then, of course, Genesis 2, you know, then God recreated the world in the way that it is. And in that way, they think they're going to merge both the idea of evolution and creation. Now the problem here is that if God destroyed the world, there would be a record of it in the geological table. And there isn't. Not in the one that they're talking about. Also, this would mean that there was sin in the world, in the physical world, before Adam. But the Bible says that sin came through Adam. And so dead things representing the fossil record point to death and sin. And we know that sin is what brings death into the world. So you make the conclusion, hmm, if there are fossils before Adam, that means there is sin and death in the world before Adam. And that contradicts what the Bible says, because what does the Bible say? The Bible says, through one man, sin entered the world, and through sin, death. So the Bible clearly states that sinfulness entered the world through Adam, and through that sin, death came into the world and spread throughout the world. Well, if you believe the gap theory, it means that there was sin and death before Adam. So there's a problem there. There's a contradiction there. Some people say, well, what about the disobedience of the angels? The disobedience of the angels happened in the heavenly realm, not here, not here on earth. So it had no effect on the physical universe. So that brings us to tonight. Another theory that tries to reconcile evolution with creation is called the day-age theory. And this will be the, you know, what we'll be talking about for the next few minutes. The day-age theory is something like the gap theory in that it tries to fit evolution and creation together in one piece. The day-age theory says that each day in Genesis is not a literal 24-hour day, but rather it's an age, a geological age, to be more specific. So in the day-age theory, each day represents millions of years where the process of evolution, 
or through the process of evolution, the world slowly became what is described as fully mature in Genesis. And so when the Bible says day one, well, the day age people say, well, that's not really just a day, that's, that could be millions and millions and millions of years. You know? And then day two, that's another couple hundred million and so on and so forth. That's the way that they, they reconciled creation and evolution. And you know, I mean, there was a time, you know, in all fairness, there was a time when the, when the discipline of uh, apologetics in the defense of the creation narrative in Genesis was not well developed. We, you know, we have today you know, a lot of people who are very expert in, this, in science and in Bible who really are able to defend, you know, to argue for uh, the creation story that is in Genesis, but they also understand the science and they're able to kind of talk the talk that you know, that, uh, that scientists talk. I, I've mentioned Kim Walkers, he's a member of our congregation here, but he's done some excellent work and produced videos and so on and so forth that explains creation and answers the arguments of those that you know, make arguments in scientific terms. He answers in scientific terms because he's, you know, he's well versed in scientific terms. And so that's great because you've got a Christian who's defending the simple, plain Bible teaching of creation but he's able to talk to other individuals using their language. The point I'm making is that wasn't always the case. There was a time when the, you know, Christians you know, were not well versed in the ability to defend the first and second chapter of Genesis using the language of scientists. Now we do, but there was a time. So this was a, these type of theories developed during that time, people say, well, I, I believe in God and I believe the Bible is, you know, is explaining correctly creation, but maybe, you know, maybe we're not understanding it correctly. So maybe there's a way to merge these two things together. And that's how these theories uh, develop. So the day age theory is one of these theories, but there's pro there are problems with this theory when you kind of look at it. First problem is the order in the geological tables. The order of created events in Genesis is very different from the order found in the geological table used by evolutionists. For example, in the geological table uh, used by, uh, by creationists, if you wish, there are complex and there are simple organisms everywhere, top to bottom, right? But in the day age theory and in the gap theory, you have to have simple organisms at the bottom, complex, you know, complex organisms at the top. In other words, the further back in history you go, the more simple organisms become. The more recent history you have complex. That's, you know, that's how they explain it. But we know that that's not true as far as the evidence is concerned. Also, like the gap theory, the day age theory has death and by conclusion sin appearing in the physical world before Adam. And that contradicts what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches no, sin came through Adam. You know, it's, a, it's just taking the Bible for what it says. You know, there's one point where we'll get here where it says you know, that Eve was the mother of all living. Right? Eve was the mother of all living. Can, can that be twisted? It can be, you know, but what does it just say? It says, well, Eve is the mother of all living, meaning what? All living animals? Well, no, all living humans. Humans, and, and who are the humans? Well, they're the ones created in the image of God. So that's why, it's only my opinion, here. We can debate it later. This is why I find that looking for other life you know, and other planets, other human-like life and other planets is a waste of time. You know, why? Because it says that Eve is the mother of all living. But like I said, we can, you can chew on that. We can debate it uh, later. The other important uh, idea here, as far as the day-age theory is concerned, is the grammar. 
The grammar in the book of Genesis supports literal days and not the idea of long ages or periods. Although it is possible for the word yam, which is the Hebrew word for day, although it's possible for that word in Hebrew to mean an indefinite time, the context of Genesis does not permit this type of interpretation. In other words, yam never means a period, although it may mean an indefinite time. For example, you can use the word yam in the Hebrew in the phrase, it is the day of the judges. So that may refer to a, a kind of a period of time, you know, perhaps more than 24 hours. It's the day, or like, you'll have, your day will come one day. You, know, you can use it like that, where it's not necessarily referring to Tuesday or you know, one 24 hour period. It's referring to a, a time to come or a time, you know, a period of time. But you can't use it, you can't use that word in the Hebrew to uh, refer to an eon, okay? Or a period of time of a million years, you know, that word. There are other words you can use, but you can't use, you can't use that one. It usually means one day, 124. Actually, it usually means, in Hebrew, it usually refers to the, the light portion of the day. Even though we know a day is 24 hours, the word yom usually referring to the light portion of the day. It's never used in the indefinite time period unless its literal one day meaning is clearly shown not to be used. So if a person wanted to express the idea of a long geological age, he could have done it in a much clearer and concise way. He would not have selected, the Spirit of God would not have selected the word yam for that idea. So the normal and contextual way of interpreting Genesis 1 is to read 24-hour days. To do otherwise is to stretch the meaning to fit the theory. A lot of people do that. They have a theory, and so they're going to take the Bible and they're going to kind of elasticize it to make sure it fits around the theory. But we know a good Bible study doesn't work like that. You have to, you have to first find out what the words actually mean and create your theory from that. Okay. So there's no need to add meaning. It just means what it says. That's all. It just means what it says. All right. For those of you who are anxious to move on to verse three of chapter one. <laughs> so Genesis chapter one, verses three to five. It says, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness He called night and there was evening and there was morning one day. So the next event recorded is the creation of light. In the same way that Genesis separates the creation of the basic elements from the final form, remember when we talked about that? First God creates time, space, matter, the elements. And then it says the Holy Spirit hovered Right? That vibration, well that was the energizing of this matter into its form. You know, he made something out of it. It's like you have a lump of clay and then you begin making something out of it. So time, space, matter was there and then the Holy Spirit, through the energy of the Holy Spirit, that matter was formed into something. Okay. Well the creation of light follows the same kind of pattern, but it also reveals something about God Himself. Take a look at that. So first of all, the elements for light are created. When the Holy Spirit moved over the surface of the deep, the gravitational forces were activated and He brought form and motion to initially static and formless matter. Matter was just laying there and the Spirit energized it, made it something. In the same way, the electromagnetic forces, electromagnetic forces were activated by the word of God when God called light out of darkness. How does God create things? You know, does He wave His hand? Does He smack? He, he speaks it. 
He speaks it into existence. Okay? And so I repeat, the electromagnetic forces were activated by the word when God called light out of darkness. So just like energy cannot produce itself, light cannot produce itself. And so the Holy Spirit moved to energize the world and then the word calls light, all forms of electromagnetism to complete the en energizing of the universe. So the sun, a source of light and energy, will be created later on. But for now, the earth spins and goes through a light-dark sequence provided by, provided by God. All right, so here's the revelation part. The triune nature of God is also revealed at this point. You know, he says he creates man in his image, right? But he also creates you know, everything in his image. So the Father is the source of all things, of the elements. We see that. The Holy Spirit is the energizer of all things. And the Word is the revealer of all things, light. Okay? Don't always think of light as candle power. We think of light as candle power, you know, always. But in the Bible, the word light has many nuances. Sometimes light is not just candle power, how bright something is. You know. Sometimes light is understanding of how something works or how something is. And so the Father, in the same way, I'll give you a mirror image now, in the same way that the Father is the source of our salvation, he sends the Word, and the Word is made flesh and reveals the Father, the plan of salvation. Jesus is the light. And the Holy Spirit energizes the Son, because it's through the Holy Spirit that the Son does the miracles, speaks the Word of God, and then ultimately is raised from the dead. We see the triune nature of God working you know, in our salvation. Well, in the same way, we see the triune nature of God working to create the world. From the Father comes the original essential elements. The Holy Spirit energizes the elements. The Son, the spoken word, brings light, understanding, perception, depth to the creation itself. And then we have the day-night cycle established. Now this has been the cycle of life from the beginning. Light is day, when work is done, when things are seen. Even, even God did not add any new dimensions during the darkness. You ever think about that? God didn't create anything in the darkness, always the day, yam. So it was necessary to be specific here because a lot of pagan religions in the future would have creation histories that dealt with eons or ages during which the world developed. Christianity is not the only, or Judaism, every religion has a creation story. Every one of them. Some, because in every religion, people ask themselves, how did we get here? Where does all this come from? And so every religion has some form of creation story. The Shinto religion you know, from Japan. I mean, they believe that their, their country fell from the sky, it, you know, from God Himself. And they believe that their leaders, or at one time believed that their leaders were the descendants of the God. You know, everybody's got some sort of creation story. So, the Bible, in establishing clearly 24 or natural day-night boundaries, God clearly indicates that all of what He did was done in the normal cycle of day and night. If you read some of these creation stories from other religions, I mean, they are phantasmagorical. You know what I mean? They're like, whoa. They do sound like myths when you compare them to the very simple, straightforward, you know, some, some people say, well, you know, don't you think it's hard to believe in the creation story in the Bible? And
Not really, because if God is the all-powerful God, I mean, if God is really God, then it's not a stretch to believe that God could create and God could do this and you know, God could do that. And He could do it effortlessly. In other words, simply by speaking it into existence and not having to take what we consider a, you know, a gazillion years. You know, we, we live in a one week, we live in a, a day light, you know, day night cycle. We live, we've always lived in a day night cycle. And so you know, the Bible says, and then God created in six cycles, He created the entire world. So yeah, no, it's not that much of a stretch. So God did not abolish darkness. Darkness will be abolished when the new heavens and the new earth, when God creates the new heavens and the, do you, do you ever realize that His work of creation is not finished yet? I mean, it was finished for the earth, the physical universe. But the Bible also says that there will be a new heaven, a new earth. In other words, it's the way of saying, in the Bible, it's the way of saying a new dimension. So a new dimension will be created in that, and in that dimension, certain elements will not be there. Sin will not be there and everything that comes with it, but also darkness will not be there. What we, you know, the absence of light. So on, a, on a metaphysical plane, the idea that darkness won't be there means that ignorance will not be there. We will know who God is. And He, of course, already knows who we are. But we will also know who we are and we will know each other. This is the essential difference between uh, Christianity and its concept of the afterlife and all other religions and their idea of the afterlife. We're, one of the, we're the only religion actually that believes that we will maintain our conscious being in a perfected state in an intimate relationship with God. Christianity is the only religion that, that has that as its heaven, if you wish. All right, so let's summarize. First of all, God creates the basic matter of the universe. Then He creates angels, judges the ones who will fall. There are all kinds of passages in the New Testament that talk, in Jude, for example, 1 Peter, that talk about angels and their judgment and you know, how they are restricted, the evil ones. He energizes matter to give it form and motion. Then He creates the basis for light. In other words, the electromagnetic spectrum. And then he sets into motion the day-night cycle. Now, people reject this because it seems hard to believe that God could do it or that He could do it in a one-day period. You know, they're saying, how could God do this in six days? So instead of believing that, they would rather believe that it all took place by chance. That's like a better way to believe, that it all happened by you know, chance, or that God started it and then He just let it go. You know, like the, the pinball machine, you, know, you just, like you know, sometimes you, 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 you play the little flippers you know, to try to move the ball, but imagine if you didn't play the flippers, you know, it's just chance, right? So some people would rather believe that God, you know, bing, let the ball go, created everything, and then just sat there for a couple of billion human years you know, to watch it kind of come together by chance. And I say to myself, really? That's how God works? Because when we examine how God works in other parts of the Bible, He sure doesn't work like that. He gives to Moses and to Aaron you know, very specific detailed plans of how to build the tabernacle and how to offer worship and very, very detailed, very, very planned, nothing left to chance. Okay, so we're, we're asked to believe that the God who acted like this with the Jewish people and, and with Christians, that God left to chance everything else? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Genesis tells us in rather plain language that this tremendous activity was all done in one day night cycle and we are called to believe God's account, not man's account. Some people um, ask me, well, you know, how do, how, do you, how do you get to a point of being at peace with 
a very complex idea of how the creation was made and so on and so forth. You know, there's so much science involved and I'm certainly not a scientist and so on and so forth. And I'll tell you how I, how I get to it, me personally. This is the verse that gets me to it. It's not even in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament. It's Hebrews 11.3. The writer says, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. That's the New Testament. That's the New Testament. So in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, through the inspired writer, is saying to me, Michael, I'm not asking you to understand how God did it. I'm asking you to believe that He did do it. And He did it in a way that you, know, you can't grasp. You don't know how He made the things that are. And you notice, it doesn't say here, He made them out of things that didn't exist. That's something out of nothing. He says, was made out of things you know, which are not visible. The things that are visible are made from things that are not visible. Didn't say they didn't exist, just not visible to us. Okay. So again, it's like uh, you know, the Acts chapter 2 verse 38 tells us that when we believe and repent, we're baptized into Christ, not only are our sins forgiven, but we receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. All right. How does that happen? How does a spirit live inside of a human body? What, 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 what's the, how does that work? You know, does he complete me from the scalp to my toes? You know, we have a doctor here, can he explain? The, the, where does the spirit live inside of us? Is there a space between the liver and the heart? You know, we don't know. It's one of those things where the Bible says, I'm not, I'm not asking you to understand how it's done. I'm asking you to believe that it is done. And we see the evidence of it, of course, in a, in a spiritual and faithful life. We see the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, so on and so forth. But we don't quite understand how the two coexist in one form in the same way. There are many things we don't understand about the creation, but God has asked us simply to believe that He has created the world. And according to Genesis, He did it in six one-day periods. All right, that's it for now. We'll move on. Less theory, more verses uh, uh, next week. All right, that's good. Thank you for your attention.